All right, structure in context. 2.1. We're looking at structure in context, and we're going to talk about structure in context under five different headings. Uh, or another way to put it, uh, there'll be an introductory section, and then we'll look at four different passages um, related to structure in context. So 2.1, the basics of structure. How do we think about structure, and I mean structure of language, structure of communication, when we come to the Bible? Should we think about structure? Hopefully the answer you're thinking of is yes. Think about it this way. You see in your notes, every text has a structure. Structure helps to reveal emphasis or emphases. An emphasis shapes interpretation and application. You probably won't memorize that, but that's what we have in mind here. Every text has a structure. It's hidden sometimes. We have to go looking for it. That structure will help reveal emphasis or emphases. And then that emphasis helps shape interpretation and application. Nathan was talking about different genres in his last talk, different styles of literature. And you should know that different genres utilize different structures of language, and hence they require different tools for interpretation. So help me out. With epistles, what is that? What kind of genre is that? What are we talking about here? Or what tools would we use to try to understand epistles? What are we looking for for trying to understand Paul's letters, for instance? What might give clues to what he's doing, what he's trying to communicate. The audience. the audience, yeah, that would be a factor. That's a factor really for any of the different genres. How about things like uh, dependent clauses? Diagramming is a useful tool sometimes. Uh, I know none of us want to go back and do it again. Um, we preachers kind of have to sometimes, but uh, thinking of logical flow, that's what really we're looking at when we're talking about Paul's instructive epistles. We're looking for grammar, right? We're looking for repeated words. We're trying to look for modifiers. What is doing what to what, you know? What, what's the main point? That kind of thing. With poetry, what is it that we're looking for or might give us a clue to, to meaning? Yeah, contrasting images. Sometimes it's not a contrast, it's a parallel, parallelism. Here are two lines. They're saying the same thing in two different ways, and they help each other um, understand. Again, with poetry, you have repetition, key words, that kind of thing. With apocalyptic, we're looking for symbols. We're trying to understand those symbols. We're thinking about cycles, perhaps. And then with history or narrative, you have character development, you have, you have surprises that might pack a punch in the middle of a story, and what else? What else would we use or utilize or look for in the gospel narratives or any narrative to try to understand meaning? The setting. What's that? The setting. The setting, yeah. And setting is what? Plot, yeah, right? Setting is that first thing uh, when we talk about plot. That's what you have in your notes. Uh, skip down. Nathan already covered what genres do we find in gospel accounts. The answer is you've got all kinds, but we're going to focus on narrative today. And with narrative, you've got this plot analysis thing. You have characters. I won't spend any time talking about characters today. But that's one way to look at a passage, a string of characters who are comparing or contrasting different themes or reactions to Jesus. You have surprises. That's something we will talk about a little bit today in my talk. And mostly we'll talk about plot analysis or a plot arc. So Randy already got us started. If you've got that little plot arc going on on the bottom of your notes, you want to write setting there at that first stage. Almost every story begins with a setting. What's right at the top? What do we want to put at the top? Let's skip to that one. Remember this? Climax, yeah. Climax goes at the top. 
All this goes back to Aristotle. He says that there's a beginning, middle, and end of every story. Since then, literary critics have come along and said, really, there's five parts to, to any story. And that's what you see here. You really, you can draw lines in what we're going to, to show here on this, on this diagram, and, and you'll see it breaks up into five parts. But what do we have between setting and climax? Do you remember? What is it? Building up, yeah. It's sometimes called the rising action or conflict. So I'll just put both of those there at the same time. You've got conflict or rising action, depending on which word you want to use. Sometimes it doesn't look quite like a conflict, but it looks like some sort of dramatic suspense. How about the other side of climax? What's that? Resolution. Yeah, resolution goes there. It's also called, you got rising action on one side, falling action on the other side. And then what do we have at the end of the story here? What's that straight horizontal line after the resolution? A new normal? Yeah, I like that. Uh, the technical word for it is stasis. It's not a word we use too much. Um, I wrote down new outcome. I like new normal. If you notice uh, on this diagram where you start with this setting is at a certain level of height and then you're on a different level after the conflict and climax and resolution. There's a new outcome, there's a new normal and that usually moves on to the, to the next scene. The climax is always that point of tension. It's, it's anticipating the turning point in the story. And often, climax is the emphasis of the story. Okay? So keep that in mind. And now let's move on to our second point here. 2.2, the structure of Matthew 8, 5 through 13. You don't have to turn there in your Bibles. I've got it printed for you. Matthew 8, 5 to 13, what we're going to do here is try to, to put these five parts of plot on top of this little section in Matthew 8. Because I've got the microphone, let me read th this passage for us uh, so we have a feel for what it is. Verse 5, when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he, Jesus, said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who follow him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Now, this is not an easy story, an easy scene to map out on this plot arc. And that's partly why I've chosen it, because it doesn't always have to be super precise for us to sort of get something, to see something, to glean something. But let's start. Let's ask ourselves, where's the setting? Where do you want to draw the line for setting? Chances are really good it's at the beginning. Five and six? What do you think? Where does the conflict begin? Where does the drama begin to build? I think it's actually verse six, right? The, the request. You've you got a paralyzed servant at home suffering terribly. So setting, let's call that verse five. Then we got verse six. The rising tension. 
And it looks like by verse 7, the story is over or the conflict has been settled, right? Prayer request answered. But, of course, it goes on because the centurion replies to Jesus' willingness to come and heal him. So for the rising tension, where do we want to draw that next line? How far does rising tension go? We know it goes past verse 7. For how long does the rising tension go? Yeah, I'd say end of verse 9, right? Then we're going to get to a turn. So I would draw a line at verse 9, verses 6 through 9 being the rising tension. In some ways, the tension that started in verse 6 is only built by a guy saying, Jesus, you don't even have to say the word. We, we, know, the, we know the rest of the story. So we don't feel the tension but up to this point, Jesus has not healed with just a word. And so the, there's tension there. Climax. We have to put verse 10 as the climax. Should we keep going? Where does that stop? Remember, climax reaches the top point, and after that, there's a turn. Where's the turn? Anyone? Bueller? Come on, you can't, you can be wrong. 13? 13 is the turn? Or do we want to include 13 in the climax? I'd say 13 is the turn. So 10 through 12, let's call that the climax. It's coming to the highest point. We have a pretty good clue that this is the highest point because Jesus is marveling. <laughs> Jesus doesn't marvel too much. Uh, everyone else around Jesus is marveling. Here, Jesus marvels, and he gives, he gives this amazing affirmation of the centurion's faith. So I'd say verse 13, just to speed us up, verse 13 is the resolution. Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. Draw a line after that, and the rest of verse 13 is the new outcome. And the servant was healed at that very moment. All right, so we've got that in mind. The climax of the scene. Now look at that. What is the climax of the scene? It's what Jesus says in verses 10 to 12. Again, this isn't easy. I even checked with Nathan if he agreed with me on where I drew my lines. Uh, he did, but we were both kind of scratching our heads a little bit. It, it, someone might want to quibble a little bit with some of this. But, but you've got to see that this really stands out, what Jesus says after he marveled. Tuck that away, and let's ask this question. What surprises do we find in the story? We're considering plot. We're looking for surprises in the story. Surprises help clue us in to structure and emphasis. What surprises do we see in this story? There are several. Speak up. A, a Roman centurion, and what's he doing? He's coming to Jesus, right? I mean, just a Roman centurion who comes to Jesus, that's a weird thing. That's unusual. That stands out. You might say, I didn't see that coming. What else? Recognizes yeah, recognizes Jesus' authority, his power, right? He's the first one to say, Jesus, you don't even have to touch in order to heal. You can just say it. That stands out. Yep. Great point. Jesus comes to him. That is surprising. Yeah, a centurion comes to Jesus. What's Jesus going to do? Jesus was willing to go with him, willing to go into his house. And yet, here's another surprise. The humility of the centurion. He's over a hundred soldiers. And this guy says to this itinerant, traveling, homeless preacher... Jesus, uh, I'm not worthy to have you in my house. His unworthiness. Why was the centurion's faith so great?
that's really the most surprising thing that's said in all this, isn't it? So here we're now we're connecting surprise and climax. The most surprising thing is not the centurion's humility. It's not his care for his servant. That's surprising too, though. It's not that he came to Jesus. It's not that he said he's unworthy. It's not that he believed in Jesus' power. Jesus marveled. Verse 10. He said, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Unparalleled faith among God's people. And he finds this unparalleled faith in a Roman and a centurion. And then verse 11, I tell you, many will come from east and west. Gentiles, right? People in that direction, people in, in, that, in this direction. They will come from the east and the west, and they will recline at table. They will be in eternal heavenly fellowship with God and with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That's the most surprising thing in this story, right? And it's also the climax of the story. And in verse 12, we can't forget this. It's not a throwaway. While the sons of the kingdom, you might, might as well put quotes around sons, the so-called sons of the kingdom, the inheritors of the kingdom, who are forsaking their inheritance, they'll be thrown into outer darkness, and in that place they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, let me point out something else that's surprising about this great faith. I asked the question, why was the centurion's faith so great? Was it simply that he believed Jesus had the power to heal without even touching? The ability to do it? Well, look at verse 9. He gives the explanation. Notice the word for. That's the kind of grammar thing you'd look for in an epistle, but also in speech like this in a gospel account. For I too, he says, am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he does it. Another, come, and he comes. Do this, and he does it. And what, what does that mean? He's one under authority. Notice he doesn't say, I am one who has many under me. That's what he says next. He says, I have soldiers under me. Before that, he says, I too am a man, am a man under authority. Whose authority was he under? Whose? God's, yes. But I mean, what's he mean when he says, I too am a man under authority? He's a Roman centurion. Caesar. Rome, the whole system, right? He's part of this Roman machine. And he's under authority, and hence he has authority. And when he speaks to those under him to do something, he is speaking with Roman authority. You see? That's the, the great faith that Jesus recognized in this man. This man, therefore, was seeing Jesus as not representing Rome, not representing Jews, but heaven, God himself. Jesus can say that guy's healed because Jesus has the authority of all heaven when he speaks. Just like when this centurion says to one under him, go, to, to disobey that is to disobey Caesar, it's to disobey Rome, it's to be executed possibly. That's the great faith. He sees Jesus not just one who can heal, but as one sent from God, as one representing all of heaven's authority. It really is great faith. So what is the emphasis or what are the emphases of this passage? What do you think? Faith, but let's get more specific than faith. Faith. In Jesus' authority, in his power. I'm not going to put this in a nice, clean, neat sentence. I haven't thought about what exactly I would say. But I mean, there are different emphases going on here that, that, that really should be sort of like on a piano chord. You know, several notes played together at the same time for one harmonic sound. I mean, you've got the whole Jew-Gentile thing going on here, Right? I mean, Jesus is saying that the so-called sons of the kingdom are going to be thrown into hell. 
because they don't get who Jesus is. But this guy gets who Jesus is, knows that he comes with heaven's authority, has the power to heal, and this guy is going to be reclining with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever and ever in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, Jesus is now making a new people that isn't determined by seed or lineage or nationality, but one that is solely determined by getting him right and believing and humbly believing and seeing yourself unworthy. Okay? Do you see how it would be easy to read this passage and focus on the wrong thing if we didn't have something tethering us to the center. In other words, this could be a great sermon on humility and unworthiness. And there is unworthiness and humility here in this centurion, but but that's not all. It's not just a a moral lesson on deferring to others and, and, you know, considering yourself unworthy. Uh, before those who are greater than you. Um, it, it's certainly not a, it's not a passage making up a great sermon for chain of command or something like that. Um, you got to get Jesus right. you got to see what he came to do, and what he came to do um, has global implications. It ha- it's good news for the Romans, not just for the Jews. All right, I could spend more on that, but I... I will try to hurry up here. Let's go to 2.3, and let's talk about the context of Matthew 8 and 9. We were in Matthew 8. Now, here's where we're going to open up our Bibles. Let's broaden our picture here as we think about context. We were just doing structure. Now we're thinking about context. We're going to talk about the context of Matthew 8 and 9 in which this passage we just looked at, in which it sits. Now, Nathan mentioned Matthew 5 through 7. What's in Matthew 5 through 7? The Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, Jesus is doing what here? Give me, a, give me it in a verb. He's preaching, he's teaching, right? We know that, that's a, that's a section, that's a chunk. And we actually have a summary, if you look in your Bibles, at the end of chapter 7, verse 28, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribe. So... Matthew 5 through 7 is about teaching, and the emphasis in the summary verse at the end, the emphasis is on the authority of his teaching. You see that? Now we look at Matthew 8 through 9. And here's where you could just use the headings in your Bibles as helpful guides. I mean, at least that's a shortcut way. You can't always trust those. The apostles didn't write in headings. Um, But here we have them in our Bibles, and I, I, I made my own headings for you in your notes. Take a look down, without looking in your Bibles, I guess, just yet. But chapter 8, verse 1 through 4, that heading could be called, A Leper Healed. And I'm asking the question, what kind of stories occupy Matthew 8 and 9? The next heading would be, Centurion's Servant Healed. That was our passage we just looked at. Then the next passage, chapter 8, verse 14 to 17, you've got Peter's mother-in-law, who's healed, And then a summary statement, and Jesus healed many others. Anyone want to venture a guess on the emphasis of these verses so far? Healing. Ding, ding, ding. Yes, healing. Leper healed. Centurion servant healed. Peter's mother-in-law, many others healed. Then we get a scribe who comes to Jesus wanting to follow him, and Jesus challenges him with the cost of following Jesus. Verses 18 to 22. That breaks the healing flow, doesn't it? Oh, shoot. We had healing going so well there. How does this one fit? Oh, I don't know. Tuck it aside. Put, put it in parentheses or brackets so you remember. Tuck that one aside. We'll keep reading or keep looking at headings. And We would see in chapter 8, verse 23. Nathan read this in our last hour. The disciples are rescued from the storm. That's not healing per se, but it, it is a... Uh, being rescued, uh, uh, being saved from imminent death. Pretty close to healing. But then the healing begins again. Two men possessed by demons 
chapter 8, verse 22 to 34, they're healed. Yes, the demons are cast out. Another way of saying it is they're healed. And then chapter 9, verse 1, a paralyzed man is healed. Okay, we're back on the healing track, aren't we? Then we get verse 9 of chapter 9, and it's the call of Matthew. And there's no mention of healing. Shoot. We're back on the healing track. Now we're off it. Okay, put that one aside. Put it in brackets or parentheses, along with what follows, the question of the disciples fasting. That's not healing. So then we read on, and we, we get to chapter 9, verse 18, and there a woman is healed. And in the middle of the story, or at the end of the story, a girl is actually raised from, from the dead. And then we get to chapter 9, verse 27, and two blind men are healed. And, and then verse 32, a mute man is healed. We're back on the healing track again, aren't we? You see? And then by chapter 9, verse 35, we have another one of these summaries. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, that's the old summary, chapter 5 through 7, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. See what Matthew's doing? Jesus is teaching, chapter 5 through 7. He summarizes it at the end of chapter 7. Then Jesus starts healing, chapter 8 and 9, and then Matthew gives us another summary statement, this time teaching and healing. So what kind of stories occupy Matthew 8 and 9? Well, there are some that don't fit into this, but the majority have to do with what? Healing, miracles, exorcisms. So the major emphasis of Matthew 8 through 9, here's what I put down in my notes. Power encounters. That's one way to summarize Jesus casting out demons, healing in various ways, power encounters. I count ten healings or exorcisms, another time where it just says many others, and on top of that, the disciples are rescued from imminent death. Power encounters. A minor emphasis are these headings we didn't know what to do with. Following Jesus. They're following Jesus sections, right? The scribe challenged, uh, the scribe wanted to follow Jesus, and Jesus laid down the, the requirements for following him. Chapter 9, verse 9, is the call of Matthew. Then they're eating with Jesus. And then there's question about uh, them washing their hands or not washing their hands, question about them fasting or not fasting. It's about being with Jesus. So power encounters, major emphasis, following Jesus the minor emphasis. Now here's where you need to look in your Bibles, not just headings in your notes. Have your Bible open to Matthew 8 and 9 and just sort of glance around. We'll see if this is successful or not. Glance around. See if you can find a repeated word or concept. The question is, what do these healing stories and even the calling of Matthew what do they have in common? What word or concept might you see in hint? It's a word we've already seen in other passages before we've looked at today. Faith is there for sure. It's not the one I was thinking of. What's that? Authority. Yeah, and where do we see authority? Here's that list you have in your notes. If you're looking over at your notes and you see, I asked what do these scenes share in common? The answer is authority. And then look, chapter 7, verse 29, he was teaching as one who had authority, not as scribes. Or chapter 8, verse 9, the centurion. Remember, he said, I'm a man under authority. Okay? And then he talked about that authority, that he bosses people around and they do it. Uh, chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, Jesus rebuked the winds and the sea. 
And they said, who is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Chapter 9, verse 6. He says that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He raised the paralytic. Or chapter 9, verse 8. Uh, the people all glorified God because he had given such authority to man. Authority is also implied in verses like chapter 8, verse 16, where Jesus can cast out a demon uh, with a word. Or chapter 8, verse 29, where Jesus encounters this crazy demon wreaking havoc in the town. And, well, demons, plural, they say, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? That implies authority, doesn't it? Sometimes it's explicit, the same word repeated. Sometimes you've got to go looking for the same concept in slightly different words. And that's what we find here. And then you get to chapter 10, verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 1. He called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Authority. Now let's back up and ask some other questions related to these two chapters, Matthew 8 and 9. Who does Jesus heal in Matthew 8 and 9? Whether you're looking in your Bible or looking through the headings that I wrote down for those chapters. Who does Jesus heal? A leper, yeah, centurion servant. Think of categories of people rather than just the names here. So centurion servant, presumably a Gentile, right? We've got Jews and Gentiles. What are some other kind of categories like that of people that Jesus has healed here? Sorry, say again. Some people are cast out. Yeah, cast out of society, right? Uh, and respected people. Think You can keep doing this with contrast. You can think, oh, Roman centurion. Or does, Mar does Matthew use the name Jairus uh, in chapter 8 or chapter 9? Anyway, Jairus, one of the people who comes to Jesus about his daughter, uh, he's a respected man of the synagogue, right? Respected and unknown, leaders and peasants, poor and rich, men and women, young and old. That's good, isn't it? Those who are unclean and those who are clean, ceremonially unclean and clean. So you've got those who are allowed to be in society, allowed to brush up against someone because they're ceremonially clean. And then you've got others like lepers who are ceremonially unclean. Or the woman who has an issue of blood. She's ceremonially unclean. You've got those that are demonically possessed. You've got those who are uh, diseased. And you even have a girl who is dead. That's a lot of different kinds of people and a lot of different kinds of problems. Now, how does Jesus heal in Matthew 8 and 9? Sometimes he speaks, right. Other times he touches. Some, at least in one case, he was touched. And it was just the helm of his garment that the woman touched. Of course, we're not reading all this. I'm uh, presuming you could go in and, and look at this yourself and find these things that I'm saying uh, for yourself more carefully if we had the time or if you want to afterwards. But, but that's what we would see if we read this carefully and thought about these categories. And why does Jesus heal in Matthew 8 and 9? It's never explicit. I would assume he's demonstrating his authority. Yeah, that's good. Thinking more in terms of like what's the context for the healing itself what presents itself that he responds in healing and thereby shows his authority and power yeah you've got need and faith right no one's healed who doesn't have a problem they all have problems <laughs> and then no one's healed who doesn't come to jesus or someone doesn't come on their behalf you've got the centurion who comes 
on behalf of his servant. Presumably the servant couldn't get to Jesus uh, himself. So you got need and faith. And so Kelly mentioned faith as a, a theme. Yeah, that, that we'd have now another minor theme going on here, right? So we've got, we've got authority, we've got healing, we've got response of faith. Are you seeing any implications of this kind of Bible study? How about this? What might we miss if we didn't zoom out? We took this one story at a time or thought these were just sort of random stories. You know, like Matthew just... Nathan talked about Pez dispenser. You know, Matthew is just taking Jesus stories, one Pez at a time. Opens the top, takes a new story out, and puts that down next. And, or, or maybe even you'd say, well, these are healing stories. And so Matthew just grouped all the healing stories together. Is that it? Well, if that's it, then we would miss things like all the different kinds of people who are healed. All the different kinds of problems that Jesus can fix. Uh, forgiveness being one of them. And authority being the key. So, you see, there's a lot going on in the Bible. If we take the time to, to look and zoom in and zoom out. Let me talk in this fourth section now about the context of Matthew 1 through 4, and I'll do this more quickly. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew 1 through 4. Mine opens kind of neatly to 2 and 3. Maybe you want to start there. The context of Matthew 1 through 4. Now, we know Jesus starts teaching in chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. 5 through 7 is about teaching. 1 through 4 is sort of the setup, the stuff that comes before Jesus' ministry. We know it's a block. I don't, you know, I don't need to prove that to you. We should just, we, we can know that. We can know that one through four is a block that precedes Jesus' ministry. Now, we've got some verses written down in your notes, like chapter 2, verse 5 through 6. We're going to try to read these looking for a, a repeated theme. We're looking for repeated language. And just for time's sake, I'm going to tell you what that is. In fact, I think I have it in your notes. That each scene that we'll look at here has an explicit Old Testament quotation followed by something about fulfillment or being fulfilled. So here you have everything from the birth of Jesus to the visit of the wise men to escaping to Egypt because of, uh, of Herod. Uh, the, kill, the children being killed, this is chapter 2, verse 16. You've got John the Baptist coming in chapter 3. All this is sort of building upon each other, right? There are these Old Testament quotations that have fulfillment language in each of those scenes. So look at chapter 2, verse 5. Oh, well, I'm sorry, chapter 1. That's a misprint in your notes. Look at chapter 1, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Or chapter 2, verse 5. Here's another one. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel, will come. Or chapter 2, look at verse 15. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. In chapter 2, verse 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Or chapter 2, verse 23. He went and lived in a city called Nazareth. That was spoken by the prophets. That, that what was spoken by the prophets would be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. Chapter 3, verse 3. For this is he who is spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. 
And Nathan mentioned in chapter 4, you have Jesus' temptations, and what is he doing as Satan tempts him? He's quoting scripture. It's not the exact same thing as a fulfillment of those passages, but it's kind of like that. And then chapter 4, verse 14, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then another Old Testament quote. So what's the repeated language and theme? Fulfillment, right? Fulfillment. This is Old Testament promises, even if they didn't look like promises. That's for another talk some other time. But Old Testament promises pointing ahead and now coming to fulfillment. There are actually seven Old Testament quotes in these uh, first few chapters here. Now, look at this next section in your notes. We've got another string of verses. This one I'll cover maybe a little more quickly. But you have also a, another repeated theme with repeated language, maybe on a secondary level, that could also be traced and followed in these opening verses. And I'll just tell you what it is. It's son. So chapter 1, verse 21, she shall bear a son. And then quoting from Isaiah, the virgin shall, con shall conceive and bear a son. Or at the end of chapter 1, verse 25, she had given birth to a son. In chapter 2, I think it's verse 15, out of Egypt I have called my son. And then look over chapter 3, verse 17. This is Jesus' baptism. A voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And then when we read the temptation of Jesus, we come to Satan in verse 3. He said to him, if you are the son of God, and then he tempted him. And then verse 6, he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Oh, I think this is about the son, isn't it? The son, fulfillment. These are just things we might have in mind as we're reading through here. It might give extra focus to Matthew 1 through 4. It's perhaps easy to look at any one of these, any one of these little stories, like the visit of the wise men, and think about worship, or the temptation of Jesus, and to think about how to face Satan's temptations. Apply it to ourselves, and simply apply it to ourselves, and miss the broader thing that Matthew's doing. Fulfillment has come. Old Testament promised and here it is, and it's in this Jesus, and he is the Son of God. So hopefully you see how in any one passage we can perhaps get myopic in looking so closely at one and not trying to study the whole. So one way you might want to study your Bible sometimes is to read the same four chapters every day for a week or every day for two weeks, or even to go one step further, print out four chapters, or five or six, whatever you think might be a section. Print it out, start circling, start marking up, get out highlighters. Uh, try to see what is going on here. Try to look for structure, macro structure, not just micro structure. Repeated themes, repeated ideas. Try to ask yourself, what was Matthew doing? Because he wasn't just collecting stories or just collecting Old Testament quotes. All right, we've got 10 minutes left for our biggest assignment. Point five. Now we're going to look at Matthew 21 and 22. And here you can close up your Bibles because we've got the text uh, on two pieces of paper there in your notes. Matthew 21 in 22, here we're going to put context and structure together somewhat and try to figure out how all this works in Matthew 21 and 22. We're not going to start with the first verse of Matthew 21 that you have there in your notes under point 5. Instead, look at the next page. The next page, see there that heading, three questions put to Jesus? We won't read those sections that come after. But there are three questions. If you were with us in our study of Mark, you probably remember these happening in Mark. Where Jesus is asked by religious leaders whether Jews should pay taxes to Caesar or not. Remember that? And then Jesus answers them and stumps them. They marveled. They left and went away, it says, verse 22. 
In chapter 22, verse 23, new question, different religious leaders come to him and they asked him a question, and they asked him this question, uh, will there be marriage in the resurrection, in the new heaven and new earth, in the new world, will there be marriage still? And then Jesus answered them, and they were astonished at his teaching. And there's the question of the greatest commandment. A Pharisee came and uh, a lawyer, rather, came and asked him, this question to test him, which is the greatest commandment, and Jesus answered. Right after that, this is the same in Mark, by the way, you've got one question to end them all. They came challenging Jesus to test him, and he responds with his own theological question, verse 41 and following, that really is the stumper. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then in the spirit David calls him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. That's a quotation from Psalm 110. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? How is he older than David? and younger than David? How is he greater than David and the son of David? And it says, and no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. So you can see how these fit together, can't you? Especially if you look up at verse 15 toward the top of your page. When the Pharisees went, they plotted how to entangle him in his word. So they're looking to plot, they're looking to entangle, they're looking to trap. They try three times, three different ways. Neither one worked. Jesus asked them a question, and they have no answer for it, and they go away. You might be looking in your Bible, and if you're trying to, okay, look at sections, think bigger picture, zoom out a little bit, you'd look at taxes to Caesar, the question of marriage in the new heaven and new earth, and what's the greatest commandment, and be wondering, what do these have in common? And actually, the answer is nothing. There's there's nothing in common thematically. These are just theological stumpers. These are the popular stumpers of the day, like uh, can God create a rock so big he can't lift it? It's that kind of silly question that they're asking, but they're are legitimate answers from Jesus. And so Jesus responds by giving us great teaching on marriage and great teaching on taxes and government and great teaching about the two greatest commandments. And if we didn't have his answers to their questions, boy, we'd be missing something in God's word. These are great teaching moments. But these are not just teaching moments about a variety of topics. They they come together as this package where they're trying to stump Jesus, and they didn't. Instead, he stumps them. All right, so these things piece together a little bit now, right? Uh, But let's back up and see more. Go to the page before this. Back in chapter 21, we'll start in verse 23. Here, there are two questions about authority, one from the chief priests and elders to Jesus, and then another from Jesus to them. It says, The chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Remember, don't forget, we were just in chapter 8 and 9. That was the big question, uh, the, the big issue, authority. Jesus has authority to heal, to cast out, to forgive. That issue is still now carried along. Jesus has gone to the temple. He's turned over tables. Uh, He said certain things, and they say, by what authority? Who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, verse 24, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. He asked them, the baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from man? They discussed it among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man... We're afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And he said to them, well, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. But guess what Jesus does next? 
he tells everyone who has ears to hear by what authority he does these things. He does so with three parables. You have in verse 28 a parable of two sons. You know this is connected because Jesus transitions with, what do you think? Isn't that a great transition? What do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. He went to the other son and said the same. He answered, I go, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of his father? The first, they said. And Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes will go into the kingdom before you. For John, remember, that was the question Jesus just asked him. What about John the Baptist? John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. They turned. They didn't obey at first, but they turned and obeyed. And those other sons didn't. Even when you saw it, you wouldn't change your mind afterwards. There's a parable of two sons. They're the bad son, not the good son. Then there's the parable of the tenants, verse 33 to verse 46. The tenants, remember this parable? Uh, the master has tenants working a vineyard. And so he sends them messengers and they kill the messengers. Verse 37, finally he sent his son to them. Circle son. I should have been having you do that already. Verse 28, he had two sons. Which one's a true son? Now, verse 37, finally he sent his son to them, saying, they'll respect my son. But instead, no, they said, this is the heir. And they took him, and they threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him, verse 39. Jesus goes on to explain this theologically after that by quoting from Psalm 118, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This rejected son, this killed son, is actually the cornerstone of God's plan. And so the kingdom of God, verse 43, will be taken away from you. Then chapter 22, verse 1, third parable. And again, Jesus spoke to them in a parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Circle son. Now, the rest of that parable doesn't mention son. And so it's, easily, it's easy to get distracted, to think it's not about a about a son, but it is about a son. You see, this parable about the, the wedding garment, the wedding feast, they're invited, but they refuse the invitation. And then they're spotted inside without a wedding garment. It's like they don't have the invitation. They don't have the, the key. They don't have the password, you could say. And so by verse 12 and following, He's, this, this one is confronted. Where's your wedding garment? He was speechless. Verse 13, Then the king said to his attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into out of dark, outer, outer darkness. And in that place to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. In other words, Jesus was saying to them, Not only are you not my son, you're not invited to the wedding. You were invited and you refused the invitation, and then you tried to sneak in. You guys are imposters. You are intruders. Not only are you not sons, you're fakes, and you are not welcome at the wedding feast of the true son. Now, why did I have you circle son? Just because those three parables have sons in them? Yes, that's part of it. But what was the last thing we read? The second page of Matthew 21 and 22. What was the last thing? Jesus' question to them had to do with a what? A son. David's son. We've got this big son section going on here, right? Now we can see the drama play out, can't we? You see, the contested point is not about taxes, the contested point is not about marriage. It's not about what heaven will be like. The contested point, the most contested point in this section here is not about the greatest commandment. It goes back to that beginning, the first part we read. By what authority and who gave you this authority? 
Verse 23 of chapter 21. By what authority? Who gave you this authority? The answer, Jesus says at first, I'm not going to give you an answer. But then he gives an answer. By what authority? Well, he's the son. Who gave him that authority? The father gave it to him. He's the son of God. He's also the son of David. And he's David's Lord. So we're seeing and learning that these gospel accounts don't just have scenes and plots like we saw in Matthew 8, 5 to 13, the centurion's servant healed. But they also have acts, you could say. They have cycles, you could say. They have sections that we should be watching for. And they also have repeated developing themes all the way through these cycles and sections. So here's where I'm going to piece this all together. Matthew 1 through 4, we saw the fulfillment of Old Testament coming in a son. Fulfillment in a son. We get to Matthew 21 and 22. We have Jesus quoting more Old Testament passage, more Old Testament Bible, and saying he's the son. Telling parables about being the son. In Matthew 8 and 9... When we were looking at that, we, we saw Jesus' authority to heal and to forgive. And we also saw the, the lesser theme of Gentile salvation. Right? In Matthew 21, the question is, by what authority? Authority's back again. And then related to that is, who's in and who's out? If you get his authority, even prostitutes can be in. And if you don't get him or his authority, then even religious leaders will be cast out of, out of the wedding and into hell. Authority. Now get this. You come to the end of Matthew, and here's what we find. Matthew 28, 18, and 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. You baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God's word isn't to be merely analyzed like it's in a Petri dish. God's word isn't subject to our mechanical investigation. Be careful about doing Bible study only this way. Ah, connections, big picture. I see where it's going. I saw stuff I didn't see before. That's all good. But remember, God's word is to be experienced and prayed through and applied in various ways. However, careful study can have much devotional, meditative, experiential, worshipful, and practical power. So don't think that those two are against each other. That's my last thought. Let's pray. Father, help us to understand your word. Help us to understand and love the Jesus in its pages. We thank you for him coming, for him dying, for him living. And we thank you, Lord, that we've been changed by it. We pray in his name and for his glory. Amen.